Over the decades, the making of Doctor Who has been a story of rebirth, regeneration and revitalization. Of course, before you can be revitalized, things might have to get a little tired, silly, sloppy, goofy and just plain ridiculous first. This was possibly classic Doctor Who at its lowest ebb, or at least one of them. Let's look at the 17th season of Doctor Who. <laughs> The 16th season, or the key to time year, had generally been considered successful, so producer Graham Williams returned for his third year overseeing the show, along with a new script editor and his star now the longest serving Doctor. Things were looking positive for a new season, the 17th, for broadcast in autumn 1979. You know, things don't always work out the way you expect them. My high school guidance counsellor suggested I scale back my expectations about my dream career of driving an 18-wheeler full of unsold Genesis albums on their way to the landfill. Where are we going? Are you talking philosophically or geographically? Philosophically. Then we're going to lunch. Anyway, the 17th season was to involve the series' first ever location filming outside of the UK, the highest ratings it had ever achieved, but also terrible behind-the-scenes tension, script problems, effects problems, director problems, and finally a strike killing the final story from the highest profile writer ever to write for Doctor Who. Season 17 had to introduce two new actors playing the existing companions. Firstly, Mary Tam didn't want to continue as Romana, but since the character was a Time Lord, she could merely regenerate. And that's exactly what happened in one of the series' most controversial regeneration sequences ever. But, you know, it seems a bit tame now. Romana tries on a few bodies just like it was a change room in a boutique. Exactly, good heavens, that's exactly right. Ha! I never realised you had such a sense of style. Oh. Don't you like it? I think it'll do very nicely. The arms are a bit long. I can always take them in. Lala Ward was cast as the second on-screen incarnation of Romana Dvoratralunda. Ward, of course, had played a different character in the last story of the previous season. So she seemed like she was a good fit for the way the series was made at this time. Romana II is a lot more confident and more likely to get testy and frustrated with the Doctor. Not again. In short, she takes none of his shit and intellectually can hold her own in any argument. What? This? Yes. CT? Yes. Are you joking? Do I look as if I'm joking? Well? Oh, I need a screwdriver. As good as Mary Tam was by the end of her tenure, Lala Ward just nails the role from the get-go. Authoritative, a bit more worldly and less naive than the previous incarnation, just as condescending. Hearts. How many have you got? One for casual, one for best. It also helps that Ward and Tom Baker got on well together behind the scenes. If you know what I mean, nudge nudge, you know, well, it's sort of complicated. I want you to wear this. K9 was also still around, but now David Brealey took over vocal duties. His delivery is a little more shrill than John Leeson's, but Brealey is decent enough given that he only says dialogue in three televised stories. Bushwhacked! Cowardly attack by a person or persons unknown. Laryngitis! How can a robot catch laryngitis? I mean, what do you need it for? Any new season needs a strong launch, and what better way to kickstart a new run of Doctor Who than an exciting four-part adventure with the Daleks? Except, well, we didn't quite get that. Destiny of the Daleks would be Dalek creator Terry Nation's final script for the series before he relocated to the US, where it seems his total produced output was limited to a few scripts for MacGyver and some odds and ends. Destiny of the Daleks has an interesting premise, but the execution really lets it down. Like when you're excited to be told that you've won on a horse that's on his last race, but then you find out what you've actually won is the horse. After Romana's regeneration and K-9 out sick, the TARDIS lands on a highly radioactive planet covered with ruins. The Doctor and Romana meet a race of Instagram influencers called the Mavellans. The Boney M Appreciation Society are interested in what's happening on this planet, which they identify as Scaro. The Daleks have returned home to look for something and that turns out to be their creator, Davros, who was supposed to have been dead for thousands of years, but apparently he still had enough charge to remain on standby. Meanwhile, my phone needs charging every three hours. Just as I thought. Just another race of robots no better than the Daleks. The Mavellans and Daleks are deadly enemies, but their battle fleets are both controlled by perfectly logical computers that can't counter the moves of the other, meaning every battle ends in a draw. It's like trying to counter a hangover with more whiskey. You don't get very far because A, you've lost your license, 
B, you've driven into the duck pond, and C, the ducks have very good lawyers. The story itself is quite good, and the dialogue generally works well. Nation's stories work best when he has an interesting premise to hang the action on, even if he does imply that the Daleks are now pure robots with no organic component, like a logistics manager's wet dream. Of course. The Daleks were originally organic life forms. Destiny of the Daleks is held back by a production that is, for various reasons, sloppier than it should be. Like a slop bucket in a pigsty. I'll turn Davros and his life support system into scrap metal now. Spack off! Even with all of the usual late 70s issues such as budgetary pressures and high inflation, Destiny of the Daleks is crippled by a general feeling of malaise, particularly in the studio sequences. While these lightweight dummies look a bit suspect in behind the scenes pics, they weren't shown in close up. The working Dalek props look okay in the film sequences, but any damage they had incurred on location was not properly repaired, and so the Daleks in the studio look knackered. They wobble when they move, and they audibly squeak, like a winch with a hangover. By now, the BBC's Dalek props were a sorry looking lot, some of which dated back to 1963, or at least bits of them. These mix and match Daleks have panel gaps only a Tesla quality control inspector would accept. For whatever reason, the story also has very little music compared to most stories, so any action sequences feel really flat. Say what you like about Dudley Simpson, but the only thing worse than too much Dudley is too little Dudley. Daleks exterminate a few slaves around the place, and unlike the hideous screams we see in other Dalek stories, here the extras, who weren't being paid to act, just slowly and gently lay on the ground without a peep, which completely undercuts the drama. In my mind, there's a deleted scene where one of them even puts down a yoga mat first. The Mavellans almost worked, but it's one of those times where they thought, screw it, the Mavellans don't need any sort of special effect to indicate they're firing a weapon. And they are also disabled insanely cheaply. Basically, like when you check out of a hotel room and all the lights go out when you remove the keycard from the reader, the Mavellans are the most disco influenced creation ever to appear in the series. <laughs> Destiny of the Daleks also brings back Davros, creator of the Daleks and megalomaniac extraordinaire. You will return me to the Daleks. Shut up or I'll switch you off. The original Davros, Michael Wisher, was not available, and neither apparently was anyone who might actually fit the mask. David Goodison fills the role, and he's sort of adequate, but with none of the range of Wisher, and his mask clearly doesn't fit, nor does it have any flexibility by now. There's nothing you can do to stop it now and his chair needs its 100,000 years service, since it wobbles and bobbles like a pop star's twerking butt cheeks. If you're supposed to be the superior race of the universe, why don't you try climbing after us? Bye-bye! Destiny, though, is entertaining enough. It just feels like it should have been better made. City of Death by David Agnew is a step up. In fact, it's several steps up. Like taking the stairs to the top of the Empire State Building, and it's by far the best story of the season. David Agnew is, of course, a BBC pseudonym previously used on Invasion of Time, except here it covered for the fact that the script was written by Douglas Adams, who more or less performed a page one rewrite when the original script by David Fisher needed a lot of work to make it filmable within the show's budget. The Doctor and Romana are visiting Paris when they get involved with a thuggish private detective, Duggan, who's investigating underhanded dealings in the art world. Enter Count Scarlioni and his wife, called, funnily enough, the Countess, and this pair of Counts have their eyes on stealing the Mona Lisa, which is a bit rich considering they already have six of the bloody things in the basement. Scarlioni is more than just playing top trumps with masterpieces, he's financing time travel experiments because, yeah, he's not human, and he needs to go back in time for various reasons. City of Death must have overcome a lot to turn out this well. 
Considering the quality of the rest of the stories this year, City almost belongs in another better season, which is almost any of them. There are bad Who stories, mediocre Who stories, good ones even, but this is one of the greats. Here everything clicked into place, even after the difficult gestation. With the story set in Paris, the production office worked out they could just about squeeze enough out of the budget to send minimal cast and crew to shoot locations in Paris itself, even though it's mainly running around Parisian streets. An overseas location shoot was novel for Doctor Who. And no, Wales does not count. Well, that's a very small place when you consider the size of the universe. Indeed, filming outside the UK only happened a very few times during the early 80s. The French locations add so much colour colour that's sorely missing from this era of the show. The humour works in conjunction with the script, but a good guest cast elevates the material. You're going to help me. I am. You are indeed. And if you do not, it'll be so much the worse for you, for this young lady, and for thousands of other people I could mention if I happened to have the Paris telephone directory on my person. Space 1999's Catherine Schell as the Countess proves to be the most discreet, if somewhat clueless aristocrat playing at being an art thief. I was rather under the impression that Mr. Duggan was following me. <laughs> oh, well... <laughs> You're a beautiful woman, probably. Julian Glover makes a role that could have gone pear-shaped in lesser hands into something really special. Charming, ruthless, and with a sense of humour. But not good enough. Kill them. David Graham, the voice of Brains and Thunderbirds, and also one of the original Dalek voices, channels his best Pavel Chekhov impersonation, and Tom Chadburn as Duggan is one of the silliest contemporary characters this series had shown us for a while. City of Death has sparkling dialogue, mostly good effects, one of Dudley Simpson's best scores and performances that had no right to be in this season. Like someone with a back row ticket hanging out in the front row. Get back to the back row, you cheapskate. On its original broadcast, City of Death achieved the series' highest ever ratings, with part four cracking 16 million viewers. I mean, not literally, that would be messy, but 16 million people watched Tom Baker running around Paris with Lala Ward dressed as a schoolgirl. We'd like to think it was solely down to this being a great piece of TV, with Lala Ward dressed as a schoolgirl, but the reality is the commercial alternative was off air due to strike action. Now, don't get too excited about Who triumphing over its fallen competition, not yet. Doctor Who was also not generally a show known for surprising cameos, but City of Death did give us this gem. So, you know, that was great. Are there any more at home like that? The answer is unfortunately no. Because just as quickly as City of Death showed that there was life in the show that was now 17 years old, the next few stories were to prove, let's be diplomatic, rather shitful, like a shit fillet with shit sauce. Creature from the Pit from David Fisher is just not a story that worked on many levels or really any levels. It's a story about the planet Chloris, overrun by plant life, but with very little native metal. Good boy, K9! It's ruled by the scheming Lady Adrasta, with Fisher again providing a strong female lead character. She's banished a giant something down a pit. Yes, that pit. I mean, there is just the one. And when the Doctor and Romana arrive, it doesn't take long for the Doctor to jump into said pit. What he finds are a discarded astrologer who hates being called Cat Weasel and, well, whatever the hell this is. Jesus. Jesus. The green ball bag is a Tythonian emissary called Erato. He just happens to look like a giant green scrotum. Doctor Who fans forgive a lot. This is going to be very nasty. You, you just have to. But yeah, not this. Lack of money, lack of time, but whatever the reason, it works about as well as a fire engine in a desert during a decades-long drought. What about the rest of the story? The clumsy comedy rebels? Uh, no. Lady Adrasta? Well, she actually seems interested in eating the scenery, so there's that at least. We call it the pit. Ah, you have such a way with words. Romana using K9 as a hand cannon. It either amuses or bemuses. Personally, I love it. But for longtime series director Christopher Barry, who helmed the very first Dalek episodes, this is not a great show to end his contribution to the series. Unfortunately, Amateur Hour was to play an extended engagement. Have you ever thought of taking up another line of work? I don't think astrology is your forte. You've been a good dog to me, K9. The best I ever had. Thank you, Master. Nightmare on Eden sees Bob Baker providing his only solo script for the series, which also proved to be his last. A space liner coming out of hyperspace crashes with a freighter, which ends up with the two ships fused together in places, like embedding a Mars bar in cake batter before you pop it in the oven. 
the doctor and Romana arrive to find someone is smuggling the deadly drug Vraxoan. And then there are some monsters set free from an electronic zoo. And it's a mess. But for whatever reason, I always found it to be an enjoyable and watchable mess. Like eating tacos while you're driving home from a monster truck rally. Nightmare on Eden had two things that count against it. It has some issues with the script in that it wildly veers between light comedy and then a serious story about a killer drug. He died? But the majority of the show's issues come from a very troubled production. Producer Graham Williams more or less took over from the director during studio sessions. One actor thought he was auditioning for Alo Alo, with a comedy German accent that is part Hogan's Heroes, part Faulty Towers and old Poo Doo Poo. Well, he has a right to criticise, I suppose. And then there are the monsters of the piece, the mandrels. As scary as a big tax refund, spooky as a chocolate sundae, and frightening as an episode of The Muppet Show with all of the scary bits removed. Maybe that's the entertainment. Or more succinctly, they're just awful, lumbering and lacking in any menace. Even the wombles would have been scarier. And one thing that probably makes things a bit worse in this, and you know, many Doctor Whos, is the floodlit studio lighting which was common for most TV of the time, but there's about as much atmosphere as an airlock. The humour here is both great and terrible. The comedy bureaucrats are great, and despite the cheesiness, Tom Baker's delivery makes this one work, for me at least. You're under arrest. All right. Can I just say one thing at this moment? Well, it's simply that... <laughs> But then at the end of the story, we are treated to one of the very worst comedy bits of the season. Not not the worst, but one of the worst. And of the series as a whole. Ow. Oh, my fingers, my arms, my legs, Ow. my everything. Oh. It's as welcome as your mother-in-law at a bachelor party. But for all its many flaws, I find I could happily watch Nightmare on Eden over Creature from the Pit and the very next story of the season which for many years was probably best described as infamous. It was designed as the penultimate story of the season, with Williams and Adams saving up for the big six-parter to end the year. But for reasons we'll go into a little later, it ended up being the season closer. K-9! <coughs> Horns of Nyman, also known as that shit Horns of Nyman, the Doctor and Romana get involved in the machinations of the alien Nymon, who's promised the fallen empire of Skonos that if they bring him a number of energy crystals and a set quota of sacrificial background artists, that he will give them everything they need to build a second Skonon empire. When we say Skonon empire, we mean the empire of Skonos, and not literally a Skonon empire, which means a second Skonon empire would not, repeat, not look like this. The Skonons, or is that Skononians, are led by Soldi, who goes Skonon and on and on about all the things the Nymon will give them in return for feeding him with TV extras. Weakling scum! And then Romana discovers Krinoth, the last planet the Nymon had made a deal with, and more importantly, that the Nymon is just one of a race of platform shoe wearing bullshit artists who intend to devour everything, like a corporate takeover where they promise only minor redundancies, at the same time as ranking every employee with a number between one and four. Horns of Nyman, despite being the only full script by former script editor Anthony Reid, while cribbing from mythology, also seems to have script editor Douglas Adams' fingerprints all over it, with scenes like this. I've simply got to stop saying that. Every single time I say what could possibly go wrong, something goes... Oh! And this. That's very odd. But it's let down by a cast that's either playing it straight or intensely overacting. Graham Crowden, usually a highly respected actor, seems to be treating this like pantomime. My dreams of conquest! Shamelessly mugging and over-enunciating, like someone reading the instructions on their medication for the first time. Goodbye! Doctor! The sets are adequate, no real complaints, though the extras seem to be literally wearing curtains. The direction is also far sloppier than usual, and that's during one of the sloppiest periods of the show's history. It's like complaining about one particular dog barking in a kennel. You dare to speak to me of failure? Horns of Nyman is sort of fun to watch. Like when a douchebag driving a Ferrari roars past you on the highway with his hand out the window giving you the finger. And then, minutes later, you pass the same douchebag on the side of the road climbing out of his freshly wrecked car. You can't help but laugh. Also, uh, sorry mate, I can't help because I've got ice cream in the boot. Horns of Nyman is just bleh. 
So normally you'd chalk it up to, well look, it's just four episodes, but at least we have this grand six-part story written by Douglas Adams to close out the season. Not so fast. Doctor Who in the 1970s began with a crisis. John Pertwee's debut story was the victim of a strike at the BBC's television centre, and to get the show done, the producer of the day completed the story by using film cameras on location. Here at the end of the same decade, a decade in which Britain had had more than a few strikes affecting TV production, among other things, but the show had always gotten made one way or the other. While the ratings at the start of the season were artificially boosted by commercial rival channels being affected by strike action and Lala Ward dressed as a schoolgirl, the end of the season would lose a whole story due to a studio strike. While the story had been partially completed with its location footage and its first studio sessions, the story was never completed. It's only watchable now through various reconstructed versions. Sharda was to have been the season finale and also the final story to be worked on by both Douglas Adams and Graham Williams. In Sharda, the Doctor and Romana visit Professor Cronotus in Cambridge. It turns out he's a retired Time Lord who accidentally, on purpose, has possession of a Time Lord book with dangerous knowledge. Meanwhile, the villainous Skagra attacks some colleagues of his, one of whom is that guy from the bill, and he unleashes some more disappointing creatures called Krags. And it all leads to a Time Lord prison called Sharda, with Cronotus turning out to be someone who was actually supposed to be an inmate. But about that hat. Really? Oh yes, please. One number two. Two, please. Sugar. So we don't know how Sharda would have turned out had it been completed back in the day. From the reconstruction, it could have turned out to be decent or a bit of a mess, possibly even a fun mess, like a food fight in a cafeteria, so long as you in no way will have to clean it up. It probably would have been better than the previous three stories, which were exactly like having to clean up a cafeteria after a food fight. The Krags look like somebody took a mandrel costume, stuck post-it notes on it, and called it a day. But for the most part, we only have a bunch of nice dialogue scenes and a little of the action in order to judge the whole story on. You may have realised I'm not from the UK, but I have lived there for a time. So I always got a kick out of this scene, which is a street I walked down many times on my way to grab lunch at Byron Burgers. Well, Mr. Skagger, or whatever it is you call yourself, you've killed a Time Lord and a very old friend of mine. It's time you and I had a little chat. When the strike was over, it was considered too late to get another studio date to finish the story for broadcast, and so the season ended prematurely, on a lower than low note. Former production unit manager, basically the show's accountant among other things, John Nathan Turner would take over the following season as producer, inheriting the regular cast of Tom Baker and Lala Ward, and was given an additional two episodes for his first season, yet elected not to complete Sharda, possibly because it wasn't his. Not to throw Sharda at J&T, but it is a pity the story wasn't completed during the production of the 18th season. Coulda, Sharda, didna. I guess we Sharda known better. But when in 1983, Tom Baker dropped out of appearing in the 20th anniversary special The Five Doctors, the existing and so far unused footage of Sharda proved handy in allowing the fourth Doctor to make a brief appearance. Years later, most of the cast reunited to record voiceover for the unfilmed footage for animation to fill in the missing scenes, with this nice touch at the end. He seemed such a nice old man. Over there. First door on the left, down the corridor, second door on the right, down the corridor, third door on the left, down the corridor, fourth door on the right. Down the corridor? No, white cupboard opposite the door, top shelf. Sharda is not the greatest story ever, but a solid one. Certainly above average for this season. A year that proved all over the shop like a cat let loose in a fishmonger. While his on-screen acting was brilliant as ever, Tom Baker's dominating personality exacerbated the behind-the-scenes drama in a year where behind-the-scenes dramas came close to overwhelming the show. Also, just to complicate things, Tom Baker and Lala Ward had become an item in real life. Oh, uh, how commonplace. Viewers can see the state of their relationship by whether the Doctor looks at Romana in a scene. If there's no eye contact, that was recorded on a bad day. Graham Williams was fed up with the battles on the show and was out the door. Douglas Adams had hit the big time with his first Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy book about to make him a hugely successful and wealthy author instead of a mildly successful and woefully paid scriptwriter, and so he too was gone. Parts of the plot for Sharda and City of Death would be recycled for his first Dirk Gently book years later. Sharda would have also been the last score from regular composer Dudley Simpson, 
the last time the original version of the theme tune would be heard in the series, and the last time Tom Baker's original oversized scarf was used, which by now had more patches on it than a chain smoker trying to quit. This season did see an increase in ambitious and effective use of video effects, and there was more time set aside for adding effects like laser beams and such during post-production, rather than trying to do it all live. Also, around this time, the lamp on top of the TARDIS prop would change for no good reason back and forth between a standard clear flashing lamp and a spinning blue siren style lamp depending on the story. The show was still generally riding high in terms of public interest, and it was during this season that a dedicated publication accompanied the show, aimed at a younger audience, Doctor Who Weekly featured a comic and behind the scenes articles, and was successful enough to eventually become a monthly magazine before taking its final shape Doctor Who magazine, which, like Forrest Gump, is still running decades later. I don't know. Why don't you know? I don't know. After 17 seasons, the show was feeling a bit tired. Like trying to get through a marathon viewing of every episode of The Waltons after taking two sleeping pills. This season was a hot mess, a slapdash assortment of a few good bits interspersed with dodgy production that cemented the show's low rent reputation in the minds of casual viewers that persisted for decades. Though, those same casual viewers are the same ones who say that their favourite character in Star Trek was Dr Spock. On balance, the season has dated poorly, like Pamela Anderson. The saving grace of the season as a whole is the on-screen magic created by Tom Baker and Lala Ward, and of course, Douglas Adams' two story contributions. As long as you ignore all the ones where he was supposedly the script editor, while at the same time he was working on the increasingly popular Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which was about to become a franchise in its own right. Oh, why did I ever let myself get involved in this? Insufficient data? The 70s were a decade where Doctor Who became its own thing in the public's consciousness and not merely a Dalek delivery method, and to date featured the two longest serving actors in the title role. Sure, it had its ups and its downs, good points and low points, but now it was time for a whole new era of Doctor Who as the series entered the 1980s with style. Does that mean I can go? If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos.